Hey, Vsauce Michael here. Hey everyone, so yeah, Dr. Lockdown here. So I finally decided to get some reconstructive surgery around my face and body so I can look more Asian because uh, I want to embrace my inner weeaboo. Are, are you f***ing serious, mate? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, man, I, I, yeah, don't mind Okay, no, 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 Please, just, that's, that's, why are you even joking like that? Just get on with the bloody video. Hey, I'm James Wong, and I probably know me a little bit as the creator of Xtreon. The Sydney OzCon is coming up, and I'm actually doing a panel not on Xtreon this time, but on tips on how to properly implement science in science fiction. This could be for any science fiction story you want, um, also general storytelling aspects, and uh, hope you enjoy the video. So this is tips on implementing science and science fiction. Um, so before I begin, I'd just like to give a little spiel on uh, my background. So the reason why I think I could offer some adequate advice on this topic is because I currently have uh, some training in both engineering, in the sciences, and also the arts, particularly in storytelling. The reason being that I'm currently studying mechanical engineering honors at the University of Sydney. I'm um, also a creator of a web comic called Extreon. And I also did some short story work for the univer my University Society magazine and did some various engineering work, currently working on Vivid. Also had some past internships involving engineering. That being said though, I'll point, this is very important. Just take what I say with grain of salt. It's storytelling is it's an art, there's no exact equation to everything, so of course there's gonna be exceptions to what I say here. So uh, I'd like to start off with a general question. So this is a design for a weaponized motorcycle uh, had for me done by an artist by the name of Leonardo Guernardo, and he's looking in Brazil, very good artist. And so I'd just like you to take a look at this and uh, ask yourself, is this a good design for a weaponized motorcycle? There's no any flaws, any, oh, can you not see? Yeah. Uh, can, you, can you all see? Oh, no. Uh, they can't see. Guys. Uh, guys? They, they can't see the PowerPoint presentation? They get this. Oh. Alright. Do, 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 do. So, you all having a good Saturday? Yeah. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of good cosplayers. Yeah. Very impressive. I got a pack from last year though. It was good. Getting traction. Okay, I'll see now. Alright. So, here's the motorcycle in question. There you go. Can you ask? Ah, there it is. Yeah. So, sorry, uh, it's actually Leonardo Bernard. Sorry, just made a typo. So, Leonardo Bernard is the artist. He did a uh, commission work for me. So, you can ask yourself is this a good design for a weaponized motorcycle? You notice. The wheels, the location of the guns, the one at the back. No, not really. Yeah, yeah, probably. Like for example, if you notice the wheels at the back, like it, it's a, uh, it's kind of, it's not really a wheel, it's just a metallic cylinder, so it doesn't make sense, right? So that being said, though, but <laughs> all right, all right. Can you see this slide? All right, fine, let's just go out. Uh, let's go to the next one then. So, the answer, so if you can see the motorcycle briefly, the answer is, well, it all depends on how your universe works. So, for, so, in, so this is something, I guess, for lack of a better word, I call playground physics. And first, when implementing any scientific phenomenon in your store, it could be anything, uh, flying cars, laser weapons, anything. So phenomenon, technology, first, you have to ask yourself, what exactly do I want to put in my science fiction story? The second thing is, you have to ask yourself, why is this not viable or heavily implemented now? So, flying cars, laser weapons, why are they not so ubiquitous, right? So, of course, you have to do a little bit of homework. Uh, no, just don't need to write a dissertation or anything. Just some, any 
background physics is like, oh, hey, lasers, that excited energy states or whatever or whatnot. Um, and, then and then three, that being said, uh, you determine the limitations of, uh, let's go with laser weapons because I use that for now. What rules need to be bent or broken in physics to accommodate the technology you want. So uh, lasers, it actually takes a lot of power, like an absurd amount of power for a laser to actually cut anything. They're actually not as strong as you think. So honestly, maybe in a science fiction story, there's some uh, gas, some fuel substance that just makes lasers have a tremendous power output. Well, there you go. That's how you have laser weapons. And as well as that. But there's some additional tips in science in science fiction. So science fiction, unlike other narratives, most often than not, science drives the narrative. And so, so what that means is if your science is off, so too is most likely your narrative. Um, and which could lead to plot holes or narrative inconsistencies and all that. So for example, uh, take Harry Potter, right? Harry Potter is a fictional universe. So say instead of uh, wands being used to cast spells, say wizards and witches could just cast spells with their hands. It's like, well, that, a lot of things will fall apart. For example, like the Elder Wand would kind of be useless then. So and a lot of plot points would, would kind of fall short. Um, and also, if anyone says, oh, hey, that's not scientifically accurate, or that's not scientifically viable, well, of course it isn't. It's a work of fiction. And so, but the thing is, there's nothing wrong, too wrong with violating laws of physics in a fictional story. Because like all fictional stories, there's an internal logic. And the science in that story is based off a logic. So as long as you know which laws of physics you are violating, and you're consistent with that violation, then it's all good. Uh, a third thing to note is, um, scientists don't know everything yet. There's like, there's, uh, I forgot the data on this, but there's like, as you can imagine, so many universities and throughout the world, there's gonna be so many research papers done. And so, they, and of course, there's gonna be, uh, there's even some research that contradicts other research. Like I had my former professor in a previous university is trying to disprove the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, so what that implies is, if you like have a spring and you push it like this, it'll go like, that rapidly. Uh, and I have another uh, person, a colleague of mine, is also trying to create a uh, exact equation for the flow of hydrogen and all that. But anyway, so bottom line, like scientists don't know everything yet. Even geniuses who are doctorates at 20, they still don't know everything. That's why they're doing research after all. all. Right. So can you all see this? All right. So this is a game uh, called a Mass Effect Relay. It's in a video game called Mass Effect, it's Mass Effect Trilogy. And this is why I consider it a good implementation of science and science fiction, because, well, what this device does is essentially it uh, projects a, what's a spaceship, it's actually a very large structure, a spaceship, to faster than light speed, so it can almost instantaneously uh, travel from one end of the galaxy to the other in a matter of seconds. So of course that, well, first thing that brings the violation to that is the speed of light. Like, it's going to take many, many years, well, <laughs> but, uh, bluntly, uh, to, for you to travel to, even from one, from one end of the galaxy to the other. But, and so, obviously, and one of the things, one of the limitations about it is that the faster you go, the closer you reach the speed of light, the heavier you become. And so what this device does is, okay, well, the faster you go, the lighter you become. So you can virtually have uh, infinite velocity, potentially. And so people might say, oh, well, that's, that's kind of weird. It's kind of violation of physics. Well, again, internal logic of the story, you know what you're violating. And the reason why they don't destruct, deconstruct this Mass Effect relay and make more is because it's like ancient technology. And it'll just be, um, it'll take too long to deconstruct and reverse engineering. So just leave it be. And it just, it just works, essentially. You just leave it be. But in the same series, Mass Effect, uh, questionable, implementation, not necessarily bad, but questionable, is the use of omni-tool communication. So as you see, that's a, that's a male main character, Commander Shepard. He is holding what appears to be a, well, is an omni-tool, and I assume he's like communicating with one of his team members on that. The thing is, though, um, when he communicates with his team members, there is, uh, they are located at the other end of a solar system, and he's on one end of a planet and yet the communication is almost like instantaneous uh, with no delay time, with no delays. And well, I assume what they do is, 
at least in the game, they explain it that the reason they can communicate is through the use of quantum entanglement. Um, however, uh, there's actually research being done um, in China that actually successfully uh, teleported protons to the moon using quantum teleportations. But the thing is, uh, that is that you must con is under the uh, it still it still falls under the loss of uh, the speed of light limit. So if you want to communicate uh, from one end of the solar system to the other, they, you still need to. There's still going to be some delay times, and to make it faster than to be instantaneously, you need to violate like the speed of light because it's not going. It's not going to be instantaneous. So, and to my knowledge, the Omni tool is not a mini mass effect relay, so it, that's questionable. So, then this topic being brought up is what about hard science fiction, All right? So, general definition is that hard science fiction is a story that has a stronger emphasis on scientific accuracy as opposed to well, soft science fiction which is more concerned with a philosophical, sociological aspects of the story. Um, example of a soft science fiction is many, many popular dystopian novels, 1984, Fahrenheit 451, Brave New World. Also, uh, Dune is another example of soft science fiction. Um, and, but of course, there's also other subgenres of science fiction, like science fantasy. Anyways, so what's the benefit of hard science fiction? Well, the greater amount of research and information available. As I said earlier, so many research papers in the field of STEM. Um, and so, as you can imagine, there's a lot of inspiration you could draw from. And they did the hard work for you. They did the research background and they made a nice little abstract at the top. So if you get bored or too tired, of reading research paper, just read the abstract and conclusion, and this, this is all you need. Um, and sometimes they have the graph at the bottom, so th there you go. <laughs> uh, so, also, it could ground readers more into the story. So, common readers, they might say, oh, I'm not really into sci-fi, it's kind of weird. But if you have a hard science fiction story, it, 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 something might click in their heads, like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I've seen that in uh, real life, I've seen some technology like that before, so it's, it's kind of viable, it's kind of interesting, right? Uh, something. Black Mirror kind of does something like this, so yeah, kind of clicks. However, the, the biggest uh, drawback to this is room for uh, messing around with physics, playground physics, uh, dramatically decreases. So almost to the point of zero, where you like, well again, it's hard science fiction, scientific accuracy is key, science drives narrative. So again, you, your science has to be exact. So for example, in a 2015 movie called The Martian, starring Matt Damon, um, it's, it's, I consider it a hard science fiction because more concerned science fiction accuracy, so scientific accuracy. Um, there's some uh, story flaws, two story flaws that I think are considered. So at one scene, there uh, you see this little facility that Matt Damon is stuck on Mars on and the door to his uh, facility where he's staying on Mars is broken. And so he repairs that uh, door, door with some duct tape and tarp. I believe that's the, word, the exact word he uses in the movie. And so, okay, we can't, so the question becomes, can duct tape and tarp provide uh, accurate insulation from the atmosphere of Mars? Because remember, the inside is Earth's atmosphere, or air outside is Mars' atmosphere is air. That's why he's wearing a helmet, or space suit, I should say. So a general uh, how, uh, description, basic calculations, so it's using something called Bernoulli's equation, taking into account the pressure of Mars uh, and pressure, oh, pre yeah, pressure on Mars and the pressure of air, and also the impact of the atmosphere from the facility to the atmosphere of Mars. Some general description of that, yeah, so you, you do some calculations to calculate kinetic energy, and you will assume a 10% error, and as you can see, the, uh, the amount of energy that the duct tape and tarp needs to resist is about equivalent to like two tons of TNT. Um, so I, I don't think that's very viable. The duct tape and tarp is a suitable solution to that. Like I like duct tape and tarp. A lot of my professors do do research like duct tape specifically, but I'm afraid that I don't think that's adequate enough to resist that much energy. Because rem so remember, it's a, um, the nature, uh, nature's a pores a vacuum. So uh, high, so low pressure environment likes to rush in to high pressure, so to balance it out. So that, that's why there's a huge amount of kinetic energy. So in another scene, um, this, this is, they do a maneuver 
that uh, that's actually used by NASA, all right? This is actually how they landed on the moon, I believe. They use Earth's gravitational pull to actually um, launch the, the space shuttle to curve a little bit and it shoots off into the atmosphere. Uh, so as you can see, it's kind of hard, hard but that, that's a payload of supplies that's being dropped to the spaceship. And you can see one little island is there and there's another little island on the other scene. That's my frame of reference to where they are. And, I, and so the reason why I showed this is I wanted to show where they entered from orbit when the Earth to that point. So velocity is distance over time. So the amount of distance to the time it takes to re uh, reach there is the velocity they're going. And as you can see, when they enter, it looks like that's around the California, just a little past California. And to the right, that's kind of where they exit. That's like uh, off Africa a bit. So again, that's some estimation. So using this map, we could see that when the green low line is where they enter, the red line is the exit, the purple line to the right shows about the, where I measured their velocity. Um, that's, so yeah, it's like some, some very small islands off Japan. That's geographically, that's what I could assume they look like. So again, using some calculations. Um, so the key thing is centripetal acceleration, AC, equals linear velocity squared over minus r. We'll assume it's just 500 kilometers away from the satellite distance. And so, okay, so the reason for that is we want to calculate g-force and how long uh, they have to endure the rotation. So it's about 152 g-force and they have to sustain that for two minutes. So to put that into perspective, um, there are two people that survive, two, two people that survive the most amount of g-force possible and what, how much g-force did they endure? Well, John's staff endured about 55 g-force or that many seconds, and, and uh, I can't see. but the other person uh, endured about 83 G, amount of G-force for a very, very short amount of time. And as you can see, that with that calculations, the, they, they are about almost like two to th uh, 1.5 to three, three times as, in, as, as much endurance as the people who, who endured the max amount of G-force. So to put that into perspective, astronauts today have to endure three to nine G-force. So they're essentially nothing less but super soldiers for enduring that much G-force. So uh, things to consider in sci-fi that I sometimes see in storytelling that, uh, that, uh, that I picked up that I think I would like writers to consider is that new technology, this is especially true in Black Mirror, is that new technology does not necessarily mean it's a new form of evil, but just a new form of responsibility. So the example I like to use is the form of refrigerators. So like way back in the day, uh, I want to say late 1800s, early 1900s, to get to, and at least in the US, and to, in the Car and, and to transport ice to uh, refrigeration to the Caribbean, uh, what they use is they mine ice, like the opening of frozen. They would go into uh, frozen lakes in the winter, pick out the ice, put a huge block on it, and transport out to towns. Now, of course, with the advent of refrigerators, all those people who harvest ice or ice refrigerators are now out of business. So, so what, should refrigerators not be invented then? Should, and if that refrigerator should not be invented, like what about uh, iPhones? You know, even the structures made through the progress of modern architecture. So what, should this building not be constructed? And so the second thing I'd like to consider, uh, I'm glad a lot of people po point this out, especially on Reddit and some YouTube videos, that uh, it's a problem with AI rising up to overthrow the masters. It, it's a very old trope, a very questionable trope. Even uh, Isaac Asimov, who wrote I, Robot, uh, in the 1950, this is in the 1950s, he made, the book was basically saying, hey, you know, like, well, AI is not necessarily evil, and even then he pointed it out in the 1950s. And so, essentially, as cynical as it may sound, AI is only the sum of its programming. Like, a robot, an AI would only desire autonomy if, if you program it to. But, th but then it's like saying, okay, I want to make a toaster that makes toast, but I don't want to make a toaster that'll try to kill me, right? So, yeah. And another thing is, here's a little obscure that I've seen uh, science fiction stories, they conflate reality and dimensions. For example, you have a sky saying, I'm traveling to a different reality, or I'm traveling to another dimension. There is a difference. So reality is a more fictional concept, 
It's basically the same universe uh, with similar starting conditions. Uh, uh, this is to say this, the same laws of physics, maybe a similar Big Bang as our universe, but uh, the outcome is different. So maybe the humans still exist, but we're all like green colored skin, for example. Uh, another term for dimensions, another term is dimensions. It's more scientifically grounded. Uh, basically, a pioneer of this is um, Professor Oscar Klein. It's a research paper in calculating um, fifth dimensional equations in regards to connecting uh, gravity and electromagnetism, but in sort of terms of storytelling, it just, I guess you could essentially mean shorthandedly, you are traveling through any universe, right, with any at any point of time. So, and again, just because you have the ability, it, it does not necessarily mean you're all powerful. Like, for example, maybe you have the ability to travel to different timelines, different realities, but you're traveling to a different reality full of people that are Superman. So, well, you're, you're kind of stuck there and you're not going to be all that powerful, at least compared to the fourth dimensional beings. Uh, this is a personal gripe that I have that particularly bothers me. So all, you, all this is the images of rail guns. So the image on the right is, uh, I believe it's in Quake 2, it's in a video game. Image in the middle is uh, Revenge of the Fallen, so rail gun. Image on the left is Call of Duty uh, Advanced Warfare, and uh, it's something to do with rail guns. So I'd like you to all uh, think about uh, what do all these uh, rail guns have in common? Yes. They're, they're blue, right? Yeah, and they shoot something like a laser, right? Uh, so I'd like to keep that in mind. So the answer is what do they all have in common? Is that they're all not rail guns. Because a rail gun is more like a rail cannon. It requires a projectile, and it's actually developed by the US Navy. Um, it's actually quite powerful, not as powerful as a cruise missile, but it has about uh, 0 0.8 more megajoules than a, than the Iowa, than a gun, than a 50 caliber gun on the Iowa class battleship, which was constructed in 1940 to 1944, I believe uh, was decommissioned in 1992. So it's still quite powerful, still quite a lot of firepower, right? I mean, you, you don't want to be uh, on the receiving end of this, to say the least. Still quite powerful. So some concluding notes. Um, so some sword tip improvements, not necessarily sci-fi, but um, just just learn about stories in the past. Like you know, storytelling is a very very old art. Like storytelling was done before the very first brick was made for the very first wall in, of civilization. They've been telling stories, and the, and so the stories that you learn about today. So you see the Ramayana, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Lord of the Rings. You know, there's a reason why these are highly regarded. So maybe, granted there's some tropes in there that are maybe considered outdated, but regardless, there's still something you could learn from these stories. And second point is, there, it's unlikely you already know everything you can about storytelling, right? Like, what can I say? Like, certainly you could just say, you know what, I feel like writing a story. Type, 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 yay, I have, I'm now a billionaire because of this one story. Sure, what can I say, that's possible, but very unlikely, and your chances of creating a dramatic, a very good story dramatically increases. And like if you learn about stories, you know what makes a good story. Maybe like read, or even not even read about stories at first. Maybe just reading story summaries, watch videos of pe what people say about these stories, why it's good, and all that. And if you're interested, of course, best best form of knowledge is to read these stories. And the third point is, this is a phenomenon I see and a lot of uh, creators of TV shows and movies. I'm not gonna name any names or franchise because I want to be polite, but there are some directors and uh, uh, directors or storytellers that say, you know what, you know, I, I get the story, right? I, I know what makes it good. I know why past iterations of this are bad, and I can make it better, right? I, I know what it takes to make it a really good story. Well, uh, I'm, af I'm afraid you have to swallow your pride a bit because unless you, like, Get, uh, get your hands dirty and actually do the research of what makes the story good, what makes this franchise good, why people like or dislike it, it's very unlikely that you, you like know immediately why people like or dislike it. So again, do your, at the end of the day, do your homework. Uh, last line I put is like in English, please. It's a phrase I see in a lot of TV shows and comics, like you have this one guy, it's like a, a nerd, 
I guess you could say, the, the, the techie guy who just explains something about technology and somebody just says, oh, in English, please. And so about this, I, I like, I think it's encouraging if you try to avoid this in storytelling because it, it basically is a little disrespectful to your own narrative. Because like I said, science drives narrative. And if you don't take your science seriously, don't take a narrative seriously. And while your readership, if you don't take your story seriously, why should the reader? And take, like, for example, take this in mind. So I'm going to assume most of you here like comic books, right? So take Watchmen, right? So you wanted to explain to someone why Watchmen uh, is, such a, is such a good uh, story. Uh, it, so you might say, oh, you know, it's just a deconstruction of heroes, superheroes, like what would they do, what would happen if you have superheroes as people, would, would as people with actual human moralities, when they're, where they're not aspirational heroes. And when you explain this to someone, they say, oh, you know, superheroes are dumb. Uh, they're kind of silly, fantastical. It's, it kind of doesn't make sense. You know, I might feel a little insulted or a little insulting because, like, uh, you know, this is something you're passionate about and they just dismiss it without, like, you know, offering unique criticism. They're just basically saying, oh, comics are dumb. And they're not saying, they're not even saying that you're wrong, but they're not just saying, you know, I, I don't want to bother listening to you. So it's uh, success starts in the frame of mind. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an all starts here of the mindset. So thanks for listening. So if I said, you feel free to, well, q and is going to start soon. But uh, feel free to send me any comments, questions, just my email. So yeah, think about it. So. so any questions, comments? Oh, yep. It's something I'm afraid I'd like to take credit for, but I can't. This is actually uh, from a YouTube video that I found. Uh, I think it's, the channel's called like Bad Writing Advice. And he actually made a good point is there's a, a, there's a surprisingly not too much, uh, sci I guess again in science fiction, too much, um, I believe, in-depth storytelling or setting where that you have uh, basically interstellar galaxies where uh, nuclear weapons uh, are heavily, heavily developed. Like they constantly are increasing the development of nuclear weapons as a deterrent. And there's also the aspect of uh, as, as essentially implementing uh, nuclear weapons on spaceships and satellites. Then they constantly, uh, and these satellites constantly orbit uh, other planets and that they could strike at any time, uh, at any moment. And so there's actually, so I guess you could say an interstellar cold war as a genre that's not really being tapped. Um, but I guess also, again, in terms of science fiction, uh, I guess I haven't seen a lot of, uh, of, of like AI being, coming to terms with the fact that, you know, they don't have autonomy, they don't have free will, and they're trapped not having that. And they're coming to terms with the fact that they're basically being nothing more but a machine and that they essentially cannot feel hatred towards a human being, but they can feel a bit a bit hurt that they're being seen as a lesser person. I guess some, something along those lines, I suppose. So, any other questions? Just a very brief historical comment. Ice in Sydney, Australia, turned up on American ships to be insulated ships. I'm uh, sorry? Ice used to come from America. Oh, yeah. To come to Australia. Oh, okay. Right? okay. And refrigeration was invented in Melbourne. Okay. Right? But there was this big campaign against artificial ice. And so it eventually failed uh, uh, financially. Oh, interesting. Uh, um, 
You mean like uh, over? You mean like overuse strokes? Um. Well, I get. Uh, I guess in in terms of storytelling, it's it's very broad. But uh, I guess the biggest the biggest um, storytelling pitfall I see is just narrative inconsistency. Um, just sticking to your stories establish logic, or if you must make it, you lost your logic, it has to not violate old ones. And so, and so, and it might sound like something fairly easy and simple, but it's actually quite hard to do. And a lot of people that say that there's bad storytelling, it's usually because of that reason. So keep in mind the the logic of your universe and stick to it. And, and you should be all right. Of course, there's aspects of making characters, I guess, believable and likable and all that, but that's for sure. Uh, yeah, it's a, YouTube, it's a YouTube channel, it's called, uh, yeah, Terrible Writing Advice. Of course, he's being cheeky, he's like, he, he pretends of giving like, oh hey, this is really good advice, and he just gives really bad advice. So, but yeah, it's, it's good for recommend As Isaac Asimov because a lot of people I know like he's a doctor actually he's a doctorate in physics or in mechanical engineering um, so so he's, he knows a lot about science and but he deconstructs like the three laws of robotics uh, it's actually very succinct very precise um, so that's so that's one I recommend um, in terms of soft science fiction uh, I'm starting to read Dune it's pretty good pretty good um, so a lot of dialogues a lot of dialogues is very cheesy nowadays, but it, it still it still holds up, so I still recommend that. Um, yeah, so I guess those two are, are those stories I recommend. At what point was the narrative of a story have to override the science fiction simply from the point of being reader or viewer engagement. The well, again, that's that's like I'm that's like I'm afraid that's more like. Okay, if in a science fiction story, like you you can in order to violate a form of science but stick to a narrative, again, you have to establish some law or some physics of science. That uh, that somehow that maybe uh, some new phenomenon in science that no one discovers yet, right? That somehow violates some new law, some established assumed established laws of physics that uh, and can use to drive a narrative. But uh, again, so again, it's more in line with uh, playground physics. You could violate your laws of physics, just know which laws are violating and why that's a violation, and that's how you can stick to your narrative. So not necessarily a research paper, but um, there are some there are some uh, there are some scientific developments, I guess you could say, as a result of science fiction. Uh, one of my favorite examples, my favorite buzz is the one I first heard about, is uh, the the Iron Man suit. Is because uh, actually the military there's there is uh, there actually are developing the, what is essentially an Iron Man suit, or like I guess you could say an exo suit as it's called. It's actually functional. You can actually lift quite a lot of uh, weight with that very easily. Problem is, of course, energy. Um, energy uh, being expended very quickly, so battery life. So, uh, but uh, another what form of it is, 
I guess another good example is actually Dune. So Dune, uh, the, like, there is actually a new study of science that was developed because of it. Uh, it's, I'm afraid I forgot the exact name, but it's basically the study of how animals in nature impact the environment and around it and vice versa. Uh, I'm, afra I'm afraid right now that the, you can't recall the exact name, but I believe that's the science of developing as a result of you. Um, that's a good question. I, it, um, in terms of uh, some semi-paraplegic um, people, yeah, sure, that can help, but again, in terms of battery life, but in terms of prosthetics, what I have seen, actually I'm very impressed with the rate of prosthetics I've developed, because there's a point where actually a, a guy had lost an arm, but they replaced it with a mechanical arm, and that they could like, move fingers and actually rotate joints uh, very well. Uh, the problem with that is being uh, the form of control and control systems. Uh, it's not a fun piece of engineering. Uh, it's an aspect of engineering I, I like the least, but it, it is, uh, so I guess that's more in line with uh, people with disabilities or missing limbs.